representatives from the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, do you wish to make an opening statement? Um, Shane Carmody, Chief Executive Officer and Director of Aviation Safety of the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to make a brief opening statement. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. It's been some time since we last had the opportunity to appear before the committee. Late last year and early this year, Australia experienced terrible bushfires. CASA supported last year's bushfire efforts with approvals of 66 aircraft domestic and foreign, to operate on bushfire support activities nationwide. And tragically, as you know, one of those aircraft was lost along with three of our international colleagues. This terrible event remains front of mind in this year's efforts with approval already granted for 69 aircraft, domestic and foreign, uh, to operate in support of bushfires. We also had COVID-19 and during the pandemic, we've been flexible in our regulatory approach and offered relief to industry where possible. Some of the relief measures include automatically renewing medical certificates by six months, now extended out to 12 months, automatically extending air operator certificates, including remotely piloted aircraft operator certificates by six months, and deferring pilot and air traffic controller training and checking requirements, and extending the transition time frame for the fatigue rules by 12 months. Most of our relief measures are planned to end in March 2021, and we're now looking at any ways we can further support the industry after that time. Although we've been focused on supporting the aviation industry through these difficult times, we've also progressed many key initiatives, including implementing commercial drone registration on the 30th of September 2020. Uh, so far, there are 3,484 drone registrations in our system. Continuing our digital transformation pro program and the extensive consultation looking towards the implementation of the remainder of the already approved regulatory suite in December 2021, We've continued all of our lines of business, although many have been modified in this new COVID-19 environment. We're also focusing on our efforts on our long-term financial health, as our current funding model relies heavily on fuel excise, which has been significantly impacted. We've been aware for many years of the need to develop more sustainable funding models, and the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly highlighted these arrangements. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and members. I'm very happy to take questions. And I have a copy of the statement to table, if you wish. Thank you very much, Mr Carmody. Uh, Mr Carmody, I understand that you've resigned from CASA. When do you finish up? No later than the 24th of December, Senator. Uh, very good. All right. Look, I have a few questions. Um, I just want to start with something you, noted, you mentioned about extending licence times. How accurate is the list of pilots that you have in CASA? How current is it? Would I find dead people on the list? Senator, the, the list is as current as it can be. Um, we, you may well find there are 31,000 pilots on the list. It's possible that there are dead people on the list if we have not been notified that they passed away, certainly. So if we did a review, it would be, you know, fairly accurate. I just ask because, you know, you hold pilots to such a high level of account, it would mm -hmm. be... Um, frustrating if you weren't holding yourselves to the same level of um, accuracy. Oh, certainly, Senator. We do hold ourselves to a high level of accuracy, but we do have to know, of course, that the person has, is deceased. We may not always know. Mm. Can I ask you um, that the budget appropriation for 1920 was $198 million for CASA, that's right? That's about correct, Senator, I'd say. And you grew by 70 staff, is that right? Grew by 70? Yes. Uh, no, Senator, I don't believe we grew by 70 staff. Um, How many do you think you grew by? Well, our, um, I might ask the CFO who's got the numbers um, in front of us, but our, our um, ASL was 831, I think, for the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, I think we grew from 805 to 831 based on new policy proposals for the implementation of drones and some aircraft management measures. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that that number returns to 805 at the 30th of June. 30th of June, 2021. 2021. Okay. Uh, the CFO will correct me if I'm not accurate. Is that uh, accurate? Simon Frawley, Chief Financial Officer. No, uh, that's right, Senator. So 885 is our baseline number. Uh, over a couple of periods we've had uh, additional MPP funding that was for one year. So we were at 809 for one year, then we were up 
to 846, though we never got to the 846 in the last financial year, and this year it's 831. Okay. So you know from my previous questions that I'm most interested in general aviation, helicopters, mm -hmm. remote work and drones. Um, I just want to understand then the function of CASA. Um, airworthiness now is handled by industry, nav aids, airspace is handled by Air Services Australia, airports are handled by local councils, uh, airlines are essentially self-regulated. What is it that CASA is doing? Is it, is it safety and regulation? Uh, Senator, um, the airlines are regulated and operate under the regulations that uh, we have published. We audit them, we audit their compliance on all occasions. Um, with uh, going through the other ones, with aerodromes, Senator, um, part 139 is the, uh, is the suite that relates to aerodromes. There are 300 odd aerodromes in Australia. Uh, we have a surveillance team who monitor aerodromes and provide advice on the safety of aerodromes at all occasions. I've got an airworthiness engineering branch that looks after the airworthiness engineering of, um, of items such as um, uh, helicopter airworthiness or fixed wing airworthiness or changes to airworthiness. So we do quite an, have quite an extensive regulatory role in that space um, and uh, airworthiness issues are reported to us and we manage them. All right. Um, can I turn to investigations? Um, I have just brought with me the most recent complaints that I've had with CASA. I couldn't bring all the boxes. Um, I want to ask you about uh, investigations that you're carrying out. I'd like to understand how many that you have on foot and I'd like to understand on average how long they're going for. Might need to be a question on notice, I'd imagine. Uh, it might well need to be a question on notice. We have, um, we have um, a coordinated enforcement program within the organisation. We have, uh, investi I'll call them investigations or inquiries on foot all of the time. Um, I'd prefer to take that on notice and give you a number, I think, Senator, of how yeah. many are around at each given time. Uh, I would appreciate that. I've, I've got um, one fellow here who says he's been under investigation for two years, mm -hmm. a private operator. Um, I've got another one who uh, complained of the process of... I have numerous cases of, of the investigations being carried out in a manner that I don't think is reflective of what a private individual is operate, operating private aircraft. So it would be it's, good to get that done. Senator, I'd be happy to give you the numbers. As you would be aware also, we have an Industry Complaints Commissioner. <coughs> We also have... Who, who sits within CASA and reports to the head of your legal system, to no, Jonathan No, Allen? Senator, that's not correct. Uh, right. The Industry Complaints Commissioner is located within CASA. That's yep. an appointment that re reports directly to the board. Yep. It does not, is not part of the organisation in that sense. Um, so does he have a, a dotted line reporting relationship to anybody in CASA? Uh, no, Senator, al although I speak to him regularly when yep. he has recommendations that he makes about activities within CASA uh, to ensure that they are in fact implemented. Mm. But his sole reporting line is to the board. Um, in and uh, sorry, I forgot the other question, Senator. Just uh, oh, The other point I wanted to make is the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Mm. Uh, I think it's uh, worth noting that, that a number of matters are referred to the AAT, not that many, uh, over a given year and or over um, a series of years, and we could provide you that information as well. Yes, I have a number of complaints about the AAT and a one particular case where the evidence, the, the witness tried to retract his, his evidence and um, was not allowed to, under that process, it's, it's probably no point raising probably, it in this, in this format. Probably not a matter for us, Senator, if the, if the AAT refused to uh, allow permission. It was an issue with the investigating fellow from CASA. Um, I want to raise Glenn Buckley. Glenn so, I'm, Buckley. I'm aware of Mr. Buckley. Yes. Yes. Is it correct that there's been a settlement made with Mr. Buckley recently? Senator, um, partially there has been no settlement made. Mr. Buckley put in a complaint about a CASA officer uh, with regard to defamation, uh, and said that the CASA officer defamed him. Um, CASA's lawyers because we have lawyers, external lawyers acting on our, 
on our behalf, because it's, it's a liability for CASA, um, offered a, a small settlement to Mr Buckley and he declined. And, and that's, that's the, the only, that, is the, that is the only settlement matter that I'm aware of, Senator. So, do you want to consult with um, any of your internal lawyers here to check that that's current? No, that, well, that is that is current, Senator. My, um, it's correct, Senator. That is correct. No other matters. All right, very good. Um, you would be aware that um, the industry has been following his case with a great deal of interest and concern. I am aware, Senator. Uh, I also want to raise... Um, Senator, if I may, we don't have much of an opportunity to defend those matters in the public domain, so we normally don't, uh, and we let them uh, run their course. It's not up to us to engage with the industry toing and froing on, on matters like Mr Buckley, so unfortunately our story rarely gets told, unless it goes to court. Mm. Yes. Um, I want to raise... Um, regulation, um, particularly part 138, uh, I've got a um, submission that's been made to the um, Senate inquiry um, from the Aerial Application Association of Australia. Uh, you're possibly not I've aware it, of it. Senator. You've read it, terrific. I want to understand um, if CASA's uh, role is to um, keep safe the aviation industry uh, in a cost-effective manner following the changes to legislation last year. Um, I'm trying to understand the consultation process and the um, culture of the organisation that allows regulation to go forward that has been universally um, uh, objected to by industry, that they've provided alternate, um, safer, cheaper, um, easier to operate a regulation. Why is it that you're continuing to proceed with, um, with this specific piece of regulation? Senator, we have um, uh, part 138, like all of the other um, uh, manuals of standards or regulations is consulted extensively with industry. There have been over 20 working, technical working groups um, on part 138. Um, once the technical, if the technical working group um, makes a decision that's, that recommends a regulation or a MOS be made, that normally goes to our aviation safety advisory panel, which is an external, which is also an external panel. That reviews the matter and makes recommendations to me on whether, whether a, a regulation or a manual of standards should be made. Um, in the case of part 138, some of the information I think in the submission that you're referring to is probably dated. Um, part 138 in consultation over the last four to five months, there was consultation that it was 200 pages long and it was far too complex. We reduced it to 125 in working with the technical working groups and the last technical working group reduced it to 75 pages, including definitions, so it's probably in the high 60s. That, um, that aerial work manual of standards simplifies 42 different aerial work categories down to three. Um, so people are not required to come to CASA. Um, it saves the operators significant time and money, and it gives us a nationally consistent standard. And I think it's a very, very good um, uh, manual of standards, and I'm expecting, whether it happens or not, but I'm expecting that the, the industry technical working group followed by the Aviation Safety Advisory Panel will likely recommend that it be made. Uh, if they don't, I'll go back and work with the industry panels again to see what other things we can change to or help them improve the manual of standards. But it is, that document has come a long way and there's been a lot of consultation with industry. So the, I'll just read a part of the submission. It is not clear what problems CASA seeks to remedy with this detailed, complex and highly prescriptive approach that creates a number of new requirements and are not directly relevant to the safe, safe operation of the aircraft or the conduct of the operation. Um, the current relatively simple system has not resulted in any upswing of accidents that would warrant such a draconian regulatory response. This, this is a... 
I, I yes. raised this before. As I travel across Queensland, why is it that in my very short 50 years we've gone from a thriving, busy aviation industry in this country to virtually no aircraft? They can't afford the maintenance. The pilots and operators continually say they cannot keep up with the regulatory changes um, that, that are demanded of them. Uh, you can't get engineers. And, and this just sums up to me this concept. What is CASA trying to achieve by making changes that industry is saying is not necessary? There's not a reported number of uh, accidents. I mean, we don't want to go back through the whole angel flight mm. discussion, do we, of trying to fix a problem that hasn't been demonstrated? Well, Senator, we, as you know, we disagree on the uh, community service flights matter, um, but I'll come back to that if you wish. Um, I believe that if we have reduced area work classifications and, re and authorizations that you require to obtain from 42 to 3, we've made this a lot simpler, not more complex. That has been the aim of this. That's where this, that's where this regulatory, that's where this manual of standards is actually going. As I said, a lot of work has been done since that association, which is also part of the technical working group, since that association put forward its submission, which I think was probably oh, at least four or five months ago, I would suspect. Um, so I, I, I'm strongly of the view that we are making manuals of standards, consulting with the industry very, very openly and transparently, and making the type of amendments that they think um, they think are important. Do you want to reflect on my view that there is um, virtually there is very few aircraft left in general aviation, particularly in the places I'm not talking mm, about yeah. RAOs and you know, the recreational guys. I'm talking about the serious pilots and businesses that operate in regional and remote Australia. I'd reflect on your views, Senator. The only point that I would make is that um, a rec the general aviation, depending on how you describe it, is declining around the world. Most general aviation aircraft in Australia are more than 40 years old. Uh, I think I could find you the average age of aircraft on the register if you wish. Um, people, young people don't want necessarily to join and maintain those aircraft and people don't want to fly them. On the other side of it, in the recreational aviation space, that space is booming. They have 10,000 pilots and 3,000 aircraft. There are only 15,700 aircraft on our register, so 3,000 of them, another 3,000 are now in the recreation space. Um, and so lots I of flying training you, is though, done in that space. I would put to you that a very, very long way away from the comfortable halls of Canberra, where we do really serious remote and regional work, people can't afford to operate aircraft. They, every pilot I speak to complains about the regulations and process of CASA. And, and I'm, I'm, I have tried over the, over the last 18 months to raise this gently, but I can't seem to get any um, understanding of why the culture of CASA uh, is so against people who do real flying in real places, not recreational pilots along mm. the coast. Well, Senator, I, I, um, I don't believe that CASA is against real pilots doing real flying. But they say, um, they, they say they, so. Um, the cost, they say so. They, they may say so, Senator. Um, every, every regulatory matter that has been put to us in recent times has been dealt with. I've heard those allegations constantly over four years, and every time I've actually asked for something to fix, if I've been given it, we've had a look at it and fixed it. Um, maintenance costs on old aircraft are high. There is nothing I can do with the cost of maintaining 40-year-old aircraft. Pilots pay, people register an aircraft once for life, Senator. It costs them $138. Um, I, I don't see what, uh, what CASA's costs are that are driving the industry. I well, believe that security and airport charges are charges that drive the industry, but I'm not sure that my well, charges do. I would suggest that you get out and you talk to your um, CASA people in Cairns and, uh, and more remote parts of the country because they'll be able to tell you they're trying to mediate between Canberra and the, the real pilots, as I'm going to describe them, and the now the complete lack of engineering and um, maintenance services, and again, I can line them up, mm. but if you don't know about mm. it and you don't believe it, then that's a longer conversation. Senator, so last, last year we had a board meeting in uh, Cairns. We, had, um, we met with anyone from industry who would want to meet with us, and that's with the entire CASA board. 
Um, I recall a few issues being raised which were dealt with. That was open to anybody in the industry who wanted to come along. Um, I haven't been to the Cairns office since COVID began, mm. uh, which has been a difficulty. Um, but um, I have been able to get to a couple of the other offices. But I'm not necessarily seeing the things that you are seeing. And as I said, we opened, we opened ourselves to industry, um, I think it was, uh, it was late last year, mm. in Cairns for, an in for, for just that purpose. Mm. And we had very, very, very few, um, very, very few complaints or responses. Very, very few people would have come because they're terrified. They say to me, can you not mention my name? Mm. I don't want to go through the two years of investigation, the massive expense and cost that if, if CASA turns its, um, mm. its attention on me. So I would well, put to you that mm. that's the reason why I didn't see mm. anybody. Well, thank you, Senator. I, I mean, I can't fix what I don't know, and I can't fix it if people don't come forward, and they have an industry complaints commissioner to go to if they need to, and that, that process is used often, um, and the complaints are resolved, I think, very quickly. Um, monitored very, very closely by the CASA board. Um, so I, I do hear and I accept what you're saying, but it's not what I'm hearing when I travel. Um, and it's not always what I hear from staff in offices. But I do hear lots of allegations. Um, and as I said, every time a real allegation is made with a, with a fact that an inspector has done X or Y, uh, we deal with it. Mm. All right, well, we will continue to disagree on this matter because I have, you know, literally hundreds of pilots mm. and um, aircraft across Australia who are either in sheds, mm. giving up their planes, mm. you know, people yep. travel huge distances mm. and I don't know that we have a focus on supporting yep. them. Send, but that is, that is a comment and not necessarily useful to this hearing, um, to this estimates. Um, Senator Watt has been waiting patiently. Um, thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Chair. Um, thanks, Chair. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. I just want to begin with a few questions about this Western Sydney Airport issue that we've been dealing with throughout uh, estimates. Um, Mr Carmody, have you had a look at the Auditor General's report? I, I have. Uh, I saw the headline, Senator. I haven't read all the detail of the report, no. OK, but you've, you've, it's, you've, it's in not, general terms... You're in general terms, I'm aware of it. Sure. sure. Um, I, the particular issue I want to focus in on with CASA is um, the air safety implications of the realignment of the Northern Road uh, and the, the impact that has particularly um, on the public safety area. So I appreciate you haven't read the Auditor General's report in full, um, but if you have a look at it at some point, paragraph 2.27 states, or before I go into it, are you, are you aware that one of the contentious issues in this whole scandal is the realignment of the Northern Road to make it closer to the Western Sydney Airport boundary? Um, I'm generally aware, Senator, yes. Thank uh, you. But not in detail. Sure. Um, and in the Auditor General's report, paragraph 2.27, he states, the proposed road alignment runs through the high intensity approach lighting system for runway 05R, or 5R, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how you yep. say it. Landrum, Landrum and Brown, which is the department's aviation consultants, advised that this has the potential to cause serious disruptions to operation on runway 5R the proposed road alignment runs through the public safety zone for runway 5R. Um, and Landrum and Brown recommends a detailed risk assessment. Did CASA undertake any detailed risk assessment involving the Western Sydney Airport and the change to risk that resulted from the changes to the Northern Road alignment? Uh, Senator, I'd have to take that on notice. I'm not aware. Um, we are involved in a Western Sydney Technical Working Group. Uh, we participate in an executive level steering group uh, about the airport, but that's about uh, that's it. So I wouldn't wouldn't know, and I have to take the I have to take the question on notice. Okay, that's fine. Senator, can I just take some yep. And uh, the Landrum and Brown advice, the final advice, was quite different to 
the advice that was in the body of the air report, but the is contained in the appendix to the report. Thank you. Okay. So that will help with yep, your that, board notice. That, that would help. And as I understand, though. Castle was then quite involved and consulted mm -hmm. on it and okay. was found to be fine. Um, and, sorry, so that Castle was involved in what exactly? Uh, in the dis discussions around the North Road in 2015. Okay. Because it is the case that CASA is the agency that uh, regulates and advises the department on the safety risks of airport developments and roads and other infrastructure that adjoins it? For um, federally leased airports, that's correct, Senator. We provide, um, we, we provide advice to the department and um, I'm sure that we are one of the many sources of advice that the department receives. Okay. So, so you're not aware of whether CASA undertook any detailed risk assessment that flowed from the changes to the Northern Road alignment? Uh, no, Senator, I'm not. Are any of your officers who are here today aware of that? No, and I didn't bring any of the airport specialists with me. Sorry, Senator, we had a, we've um, been a bit limited in our COVID sure. numbers today, so unfortunately sure. I'll have to take it on notice. Okay. Do you know who was responsible to make an informed acceptance of the risks that arose within the public safety zone from this realignment? Is it only CASA? Senator, we, we would have a, we would have a safety, we would make a safety recommendation um, to, uh, to the department in this case. There may well be others, Senator. Um, I, don't, I don't know of any, but there may well be others. Um, but as far as I know, it would be principally our safety recommendation. Mr Atkinson, do you know whether there's any other agency that would have a role in assessing any risk, public, public or otherwise, risk um, that ar arose from the changes to the Northern Road alignment? Uh, yeah, so Air Services is also involved, yep. and the expert advice, the final expert advice, um, was obviously part of the consideration of the approval of the road. Um, and you're talking about a, the, a road right at the end of sort of the two kilometre safety zone. Um, that, um, there's obviously a lot of roads that run through Hiles mm. in airports currently. So um, the, obviously looking at the final report that wasn't in the audit report is probably important as well. Okay. But, but um, Mr Carmody's taken it on notice and, yep. and I'm sure Cass is, uh, participation in this is part of the public record. Thanks. Also in the Auditor General's report at paragraph 2.27, he stated that in response to serious concerns that were raised by the New South Wales Government Road, Roads and Maritime Services, the Department of Infrastructure advised RMS that the, quote, proposed alignment is clear of the obstacle limitation surface However, the department has advised that the road may interfere with one engine inoperative procedures defined for runway 23L. And Landrum and Brown has suggested further assessment by the Aviation, Aviation Safety Authority. Do you know whether any such assessment was conducted by CASA? Uh, Senator, I don't know. Don't As know? I said, I'm not familiar enough with that. Happy to take it on notice. Okay. Are there any broader obstacle limitation surface concerns as a result of a major road now being so close to the runway or intended to be so close to the runway, for example, large freight vehicles as transient obstacles? Uh, not as far as I know, Senator. But I can take that question if you okay. wish. Do, do, you know, do you know whether any analysis has been undertaken by CASA to determine that? Uh, no, Senator. Okay. If you could take that on notice and table Certainly. any such analysis if, if one has been conducted. Is it normal for a four-lane dual carriageway major arterial road that's expected to handle 47,000 passenger and employee trips and 42,000 freight trips per day to be located within the public safety zone of a major international airport? Senator, I'll take that on notice. Can you think of any other examples where that is the case. Senator, I haven't got the plans of the uh, airport and the public safety zones um, uh, in my mind or with me, but there are a lot of airports around the world with um, a lot of um, road, a lot of large uh, 
infrastructure development and road works around them, Senator. So Within the public safety zone, well, though? Senator, as I said, I haven't got the... It depends on how you define the public safety zone um, and whether which way it is defined by those notions. So I'd have to take it on notice. Mm. Yeah, Mr Cameron, are you referring to a road right at the edge of two kilometres from the end of the runway? Mm. It's a long way. It is a long way. Mm. But surely we have a public safety zone for a reason. Mm. It, it, Mr Cummins has taken it on notice with mm. the advice on it is, but there are many airports in Australia, if you've come into Canberra lately, that has a road at the end of the runway that's much closer than that. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, well, to that point, if you could come back to us on notice to tell us which other airports in Australia do have a major road that crosses a public safety mm. zone. You're saying that you think Canberra Airport would be one such example? Just obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we well, can, I don't we know can, where the public safety um, zone is. So the, the public safety zone airport is, is, is only in force in Queensland. Yes. There's, so it's not defined um, anywhere else. And if I can take the, I'll take the matter okay. on notice, Senator, and, and construct the best response I can understanding the question that you're asking. Okay. And in its current airport design, would CASA certify the Western Sydney Airport with a four lane dual carriageway? major arterial road that runs along or through the public safety zone? Uh, Senator, we are, uh, I think that that, I assume that matter is still being discussed. Um, I don't, I don't have the details with me, so prospectively would we certify? I don't know. I can take it on notice and, and let you know. Um, I think there is a long way to go on Western Sydney Airport as yet. I know that we are intimately involved in the technical working groups and the executive steering group, so I would assume that if it was safe, CASA would make a recommendation on that basis. Mm -hmm. And in, in CASA's view, is there a risk as a result of this decision to realign the road that the future second runway could be constrained and or that a future government might need to relocate the arterial road to allow for the runway to be constructed as originally envisaged? So I don't believe so. If it's as far away from the end of the runway as um, uh, Mr Atkinson is uh, uh, making out, then I don't believe so. But, I, but again, in, con in constructing the answer, I'm quite happy to look at that matter. If you could, and if in the process, if you could advise whether that's something that CASA has turned its mind to. Certainly. Thanks. Um, that's it on that issue, but we do have s some other questions for CASA. Are you at, okay, for Senator Sheldon to keep yeah. going? Yeah, sure. And then Senator Patrick will. Keep Thanks. Going. I've just got a uh, few questions. Uh, just with the dramatic slowdown with aviation in the country as a result of COVID, um, you know, I know that you've just talked about um, the increase in labour, but has it, has it had a significant effect on CASA and what's that effect been? Senator, it's been, it's been, it's been quite interesting. Um, Senator, as you know, uh, we are largely funded by fuel excise. And you might be aware of that. And normally fuel excise generates about $2.2 million a week. Uh, to, is to support CASA's funding model. Um, in the last few months, it's been generating around $900,000 a week. Um, what that means, Senator, is about 40% of the industry is still operating. And if you wish to use, extrapolate those numbers further, given a great amount of the fuel burn is from um, the major carriers which are not operating, the response is that there is a lot of aircraft activity in Australia. There is a lot of activity underway. We've found that our regulatory services activity, the, um, the activities that people ask us to undertake on their behalf, uh, putting on new aircraft, um, uh, changing configuration, doing whatever it is they do, uh, the drop off has been minor. It's been very, very small, a couple of percent. Um, and we're finding that um, there are a range of other regulatory services activities that are occurring. So frankly, uh, our business um, has not really slowed at all. The only area where we have been challenged is that some of the inspectorate are unable for COVID reasons to be out on aerodromes and doing ramp checks on aircraft and what have you. So we've had to develop a, um, a desktop model, if you will, uh, to, review, um, uh, to review and conduct some degree of desktop surveillance to ensure the industry is operating safely. I think a third and final point I wanted to make is that there's been considerable work on the exemptions provided uh, under the instruments we put out there for extending pilot recency, uh, extending fatigue, extending medicals and what have you. There's been a lot of work to underpin that to make sure that we can continue to do it safely. 
And when people are requesting extensions, we have a new process now which is called a safety risk management plan where operators can come forward and say, we cannot get access to the simulator in location X. Um, we are proposing to do the following things and we need to evaluate that and make sure that's safe before we extend their permission. So the, so the long answer, I suppose, to your short question, Senator, is we're pretty busy. The, just the, the, uh, the government supplementary funding for 1920 19, financial year and 2021 financial year, what is, how much has that been? Uh, I've got my CFO with you. You can probably answer the question more accurately than I can. S Senator, um, the, the challenge for us has been fuel excise drop-off. That's where we've required our supplementation. Um, I know in the out years it's um, uh, significant, but Simon, over to yeah. you. So, Senator, in, in the uh, initial um, aviation relief package, uh, CAS received $30 million, $15 million last financial year and $15 million uh, this financial year. And then in addition to that, uh, once we worked out what the uh, uh, what the estimated take for 2021 would be, uh, we got an additional 72.9 million uh, set aside for this year on top of our normal 40.5 million in government appropriation. So it, it, um, the overall spending by CASA, has that uh, dropped? Uh, yes, yes, Senator. So there was 14.8 uh, million in savings uh, compared to what was in additional estimates at the end of last year, uh, mainly in a reduction in consultancies and contractors, uh, travel and training. So obviously the amount of travel that we were doing, particularly international travel, dropped off to negligible amounts. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, so we were uh, identifying ways of, of saving, saving funds. Is that, is that included staff layoffs? Sorry, staff? Does that include staff layoffs? Uh, there were some redundancies, but uh, um, voluntary redundancies. In, in what areas? Um, I'd have to take that Senator, on. Senator, across, across yeah. the board, not, not many. I would say um, um, a handful uh, year on year, probably um, uh, five to seven, but I can take it on notice where the areas were. Um, we also have... Um, as the areas and responsibilities. Yes, yeah. areas and responsibilities. We also have a, um, um, for a range of reasons, a slightly older workforce. Um, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of people are joining CASA relatively late in their careers after a career somewhere else, um, and that's a factor in terms of departures also. So in 1920, Senator, there were uh, eight redundancies. But I, I don't have the, the uh, breakdown of where, uh, which parts of the... Yeah, if you can take on notice of which parts and what their job responsibilities were would be great. Sure. Um, is, is it also, if you've uh, carried through, a, is a reduced overtime? Um, was there forced leave used? those sorts of mechanisms to reduce? Uh, we we, we uh, had a close look at overtime and at uh, extended leave. And one, one of the, the, the vagaries of where we've ended up is that with uh, less people taking annual leave, uh, it's actually sent up our uh, employee expenses because people aren't taking leave and it comes out of a liability instead. Um, you know, so we, we've, we've noticed that. So there has been a push for people to, to take leave. So during the, uh, towards the end of the last financial year, um, the last three months of the year during the, um, uh, the height of COVID, we worked diligently on reducing our um, uh, high duties allowance and non ongoings um, as much of a leave as we could to try and get our numbers down because we knew we were in financial strife at the end of, uh, during that last part of the financial year. We managed to keep a degree of control over that. So what's the effect of the reduction in training that's been carried out and, and, what's, and how are you going to try to make that up? Internally, um, we've moved a lot of training online uh, and that's, that has uh, helped us. Uh, so uh, a lot more work by teams, a lot more work on, uh, an awful lot more work online. Um, we had a relatively, uh, I'd say a, a relatively advanced training system, but a lot of it was face to face and we've moved a lot of it online. And I think that's, that's made a difference. Um, it has been, there have been some challenges with moving people around, but I don't think that, um, I, I don't think it's been any more um, of a challenge for us than anyone else. I'm happy to go. Send, uh, Thanks, yeah. Senator Sheldon. Um, I'll give Senator, Senator Patrick. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. A um, uh, couple of things. Um, is this your last estimates? It is. 
Senator. I will, um, we'll try and make it pleasant then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Too late. Too late. <laughs> Just turning up <laughs> makes it unpleasant. <laughs> um, uh, uh, now, I have put some questions on notice in relation to the space agency. I presume they're progressing through. I remember through, seeing those, yes. Uh, pr progressing through. Um, uh, just a couple of uh, additional uh, questions. Um, the, the split between regulation between, this, between CASA and the Space Agency, uh, there's a line drawn at 100 kilometres. I note that uh, the FAA uh, line is in the US is drawn at 150. Uh, what involvement did you have in defining the 100 kilometres? Senator, I, I actually, um, I know the 100 kilometres is there and, uh, and the linkage with the Carmen line, but I actually know, I don't actually know um, how it was defined. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to take that on notice whether sure. it was 100 or 150. I thought, generally speaking, 100 was uh, the accepted norm. So I must, I'll have to take that on notice and have a look. The FA is definitely 100. Um, uh, don't, feel, don't feel alone. The space agency had, uh, sorry, 150, definitely yep. in, in for the FAA. Yep. The space agency didn't uh, quite know where it came no. from either, so I'm just trying to get to the bottom yep. of it. Um, because it does create a, a regulatory um, burden on, on, uh, on our space industry. Yeah, it's a hard, it creates yeah. a hard point sure. in reality in terms um, of parents. Uh, what uh, involvement do you, uh, have you had in defining the regulations of launching uh, rockets? Um, in some sense, how did you do that prior to the space agency, or did you do that prior to the space agency? We, we um, I think we had complete responsibility prior to the existence of a space agency, but I'm not convinced there was a great deal of activity, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, we have worked closely with the space agency since its inception and trying to define the difference between uh, launch permits and area, appro area approvals, um, what is our particular role um, as a safety regulator and, you know, uh, given um, uh, our principal role is opening up airspace to allow uh, rockets to pass through and then closing it again. Um, and not much more than that is where we've ended up. So we've been working with them very, very closely. But, but there is probably some history that goes back a long way, Senator, on how this was defined. Okay. Um, uh, look, I'll just say, uh, firstly, thank you. There were a couple of South Australian companies in, um, who recently did a launch that were unable to get a, a launch permanent to go to 101 kilometres, that extra one kilometre, but uh, you, you uh, CASA did actually uh, provide launch permits uh, for the 85 kilometre launches, uh, and I can tell you that industry is most grateful for the work that you did there. Thank so, you, Senator. Thank um, you. I just want to go to a, a couple of quick budget questions and then uh, some stuff on uh, RAOs. Um, the, uh, in the budget, there was a, a, a comment uh, that was made that uh, left me a little bit confused. Um, just talking about the downturn in the in in the av aviation um, sector. Indeed, you're, you're suggesting there. I, I understand from your opening statements that there still is a lot of activity taking place. Um, uh, well, there's a lot of fuel being burned, Senator. Sure. Yeah. Um, you had a statement in there about. Um, it says the PVS includes, and maybe this at the CFO, includes the statement, and I quote, employees' expenses are expected to decrease by 2.4 million for 2022, sorry, 2020 to 21. The reduction is due to a significant amount, a significant movement in leave provisions as employees are taking less leave in 2019-20 due to COVID and redundancies of 1.2 million. That just doesn't seem to make sense to me that somehow um, the employee expenses are decreasing because people are taking more leave. How does that work? Uh, as I said before, Senator, one of the things that we've found, one of the anomalies that we've found with uh, COVID is that people aren't taking leave. So normally when you take leave, it's banked up over the period of time that you've worked. So it comes from a provision? So it comes from a provision. Okay. And, and so, so, so the provision is getting bigger because yeah. people aren't taking leave. Yeah. And so next year we expect that people will take higher than average amount of leave and that will mean that they that the provision will go down and our expenses will therefore will go down. Sure, but one, one offsets the other. If you're not, you know, you, you, if, you, if your people aren't taking leave, you're still paying, you're, you're actually paying, rather than drawing from the provision, you're still paying them. You're, you're, well, saying you're still paying them from, from a cash perspective, yeah. but instead of it being an expense that shows as an expense item, it's, it's that, that 
uh, payment is taken from a liability. Okay, so just a, because of the accounting. It's accounting it's okay. All right. movement. Okay, thank you. Um, RAOs, I just want to go to a couple of questions in relation to RAOs. Um, I know that RAOs have put in, uh, in effect, an application uh, with CASA to take over that responsibility for um, a range of operations in the recreational um, uh, aviation space. That, that's correct, isn't um, it? Exposition, I think they call put, it. They put an exposition for this is this is uh, to become a self-administering organisation yep. under Part 149. Um, I, I think that's what I think that's what you're referring to, Senator. It's yes. been application been in for a while. Okay, and um, now in effect, some responsibilities transfer from CASA to RAOs when, when, if and when you approve When they that. operate under Part 149. Uh, under, under Part 149. Um, firstly, I presume, therefore, noting the size of RAOs, that there's going to be a reduction in staff in CASA with a reduction in oversight in, in applications and a whole range of other things. Do we, do we, does the taxpayer get a benefit to this being contracted out, subcontracted out? Not really, Senator. RAOs pretty much runs um, its own uh, business at the moment. Um, they uh, they operate under a set of rules. We're aware of them. We we have a deed of agreement where we provide them a small amount of funding on an annual basis. Um, but and I would say that I probably have uh, maybe one staff member that's uh, one or one and a half staff, staff members who are looking after activities in and around that space. So I would see no. Um, Significant saving, I would see um, um, a tightening up of their of the way they um, manage the sector that they're engaged in, uh, with regard to safety management systems and uh, a general tightening up, I suppose, of the way they run their business. Okay. Now, in relation um, to, to uh, that one point, one, uh, section one four nine um, uh, delegation, I guess you'd describe it. Can you provide guidance on whether the, an authorisation holder can have their authorisation suspended or cancelled on the basis of a suspected breach of RAA's exposition, RAA's exposition? Uh, Senator, I might have to take that on notice unless I have uh, somebody can answer the question. Do you? The, 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 I'll, put it, I'll put it to you. There's general confusion. We'll take, in, well, we won't take it on notice, Senator. It's probably a bit technical. Sure. Well, there's some general confusion in amongst uh, uh, indus uh, industry, um, I'll ask this as well. How can, um, in a case of an, an accident, for example, or some incident under under the rules with uh, um, uh, our, say, our, our air investigation mm. authorities, there's no self-incrimination. Is that the case in respect of RAOs? I think RAOs. Um, I think RA. My understanding is RAOs investigates its own accidents. This okay. stage, and HSB investigates them if they wish to. Okay. Um, and but I, I'm not sure of the applicability of the uh, ATSB Act um, to RAOs. Can, can we get some clarity around yeah, that, please? Certainly. Because there are people concerned that, in effect, now they are under a new regime where the the, the ATSB standards no longer apply in respect of uh, an investigation. Could you just, I'm sorry, to, could I just clarify, so you said that RAOs investigates its own accidents mm -hmm. and ATSB investigates if it wishes to, is that ATSB, what you said? ATSB investigates if it wishes to, it doesn't always investigate RAOs accidents, no. That's okay, my understanding. Because I think that's right. That, my understanding yeah. is, is that they don't because yeah. they don't have the resources to. Sure. Um, now, uh, can a decision by RAOs be yeah, reviewable by the AAT? So my understanding is decisions made by CASA are decisions uh, of an administrative nature which are subject to AAT review. Yep. Uh, what is the situation with RAAOs? Can, if a decision is made by RAOs, can it be reviewed by the AAT? We've got yeah. council here who's itch, um, <laughs> itching to give an answer. Just in terms of, just before um, uh, Dr Alec answers the question, um, just, I was just reminded that, that ATSB has done some, yes. has conducted some RAOs investigations. So um, I won't say they pick and choose. It might be uh, depending on the nature of the accident and the resources they have available. But they have investigated some uh, uh, RAOs accidents. It doesn't sound ideal, does it? It's a, it's, um, so it's a matter for the ATSB rather than for me, I'm afraid. 
Senator Jonathan Alec, Executive Manager, Legal International and Regulatory Affairs. Under Part 149, mm. um, if a person has within their authorizations uh, suspended or varied by RAOs, they can challenge that, and that decision can be referred to CASA, and CASA reviews that decision, and CASA's decision on that is reviewable in the AAT. Okay, Previously, yep. um, RAOs members did not have that option. If they lost their authorization as a result of a decision of RAOs, um, they had no recourse through the tribunals. They would have to go to court and claim some sort of unfairness of some sort. Okay, so there, there is a pathway. Absolutely. Uh, in, in terms of an AAT review, uh, uh, a person effectively has a right to go to the AAT? Um, they will under 149, they did not before. Yeah, sure, under 149 you, you say they have a right to appeal or seek a review by the CASA? That's right. And then of course the, that flowing from that? I, either party, either RAOs or the party who launched the review can challenge CASA's decision in the AAT. Can you on notice just direct, uh, direct me to where that, that regulation uh, stems from? Absolutely. I don't expect I, you to I do that do now. it on those. I don't have the regs in front of me. Yeah, no, I understand that, but that would be helpful. I'm just saying there is some confusion in industry. Um, uh, can, uh, is a decision um, of CASA binding on RAOs? Uh, in fact, yes. CASA has the authority to issue directions to RAOs. They can give them directions to amend provisions in their exposition and they can give them directions in relation to actions they've taken in respect of an aircraft or an individual. Those decisions are reviewable, as are most decisions CASA takes, but these are powers that CASA was not able to exercise before 149. So you say this is an improvement? Well, no. in some respects, did, did RAOs have those, uh, uh, those authorizations prior, uh, or you know, do they come into effect prior to their exposition being accepted by CASA? The RAOs operates currently under an operations manual that governs their members. Um, CASA approves those manuals, but those manuals are administered by RIOs. Re mm -hmm. Remarkably, the regime that's in effect under 149 introduces a considerably greater measure of regulatory oversight than existed previously. And just, uh, I know that the, um, Mr. Carmody took this on notice, but do you know whether or not um, a person subject to an RA Oz investigation has the same rights in respect of uh, ATSB investigations in, uh, in relation to self-incrimination? Well, as, as Mr. Carmody said, the, the ATSB's role is a matter for the ATSB. The relationship between RA Oz and their members in terms of uh, ad admissions and disclosures that they make are matters under their, under their um, exposition. Presumably they have a safety management system of some sort that, and an exposition that involves a, what is commonly referred to as a kind of just culture regime. We're certainly expecting those kinds of arrangements for other operators, um, but where they are not yet in that place, that's a provision in 149. But okay, so that, 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 that exposition hasn't been accept, accepted yet. So I just wonder if you would give some consideration to making sure there's ec an equitable situation for um, pilots in, 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 be they under the, the normal regime or under the RAOs yes. regime. Okay, and just a final question. Uh, there's a, a media report out basically suggesting that uh, RAOs are refusing to publish accident reports. Are you familiar with that, uh, the, the, no. that situation? Senator, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, Senator. I wasn't aware of that at all. Okay, it might, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's only just out, so okay. um, if you just haven't got your texts uh, <laughs> happening as quickly as I have. Haven't got my phone with me, Senator. <laughs> um, the, uh, would you be concerned, um, well, no, actually, I'll just say I would be concerned if there's not transparency in relation to accident investigations mm -hmm. and reports. Um, I, it, it, what is the current uh, p position in terms of uh, legal requirements for openness and transparency mm -hmm. in relation to um, RAO's accident reports? Dr. Alec, to you. Well, you? interestingly, Prior to 149, there would have been no legal basis on which we could require them to publish an action report. Um, I cannot say that there is a provision in 149 that expressly calls for that, but it provides a regulatory framework within which, if CASA were to decide that that was something to be done, we would have the authority to require it. I, I just say this in the context of uh, 
uh, all decisions, all reviews are uh, uh, generally are better reviews or better decisions if the reviewer or the decision mm. ma maker is required to articulate yeah. what they found and uh, the, provide reasons for the decisions that they, they make. And uh, that also makes it uh, much better for uh, appealing uh, any particular decision um, and uh, um, perhaps if you could have a look at that and mm. come back to the committee as to uh, you know, what the current situation is, what powers you have and how you might intend to use mm. any directions powers in relation to uh, accident reports. So of course the other thing too is of course accident reports make it uh, better for other pilots who can uh, look and see what happened and say, well, I won't do that, I won't do that sort of thing, you know? Senator, we will. Uh, and our overall message is part 149, we thought was a, um, uh, a better arrangement, an improved arrangement for mm. uh, regulatory oversight of self-administering organisations. Um, RALs, the Parachute Federation is the first one to come into, uh, in under part 149, they've already done so, and hopefully RALs will be the second, and they're well advanced in their ex exposition. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not contesting. It sounds yep. like uh, there are some things that are uh, that are better. Just there hasn't been clarity uh, in the industry, and I know that, uh, as you know, a lot of people in the industry watch these proceedings. But I'd also okay. be interested in your questions on what you're taking on notice. Thank you, Chair. Senator, can I just Sorry. ask quickly a question on the Carmen line, if I may? Um, it's got some further advice. The Space Launches and Returns Act of 2018 sets the delimitation of space at 100 kilometres, or 328,094 feet or the Kármán line, but according to my advice there's no international consensus on this altitude since space begins where an aircraft can no longer support its own weight. Um, and so it's usually somewhere between 80 and 120 kilometres. Um, and that's how we settle on the 100 kilometres, but we'll go back now and have a look at the 150 mm. kilometre point that you made. Yeah, uh, I'm so absolutely sure that's the FAA rule. <coughs> and, and I say that because, of, because it creates an, a, a, a additional obligations and perhaps unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Thank can you, I just clarify that the um, transition to part 149 is uh, all of the um, uh, recreational uh, or sport aviation organisations, the eight are all required to transition? They can, they can all transition, Senator. Some of them may not be able to meet the requirements. Some of them might be so small um, that they may not be able to meet the requirements of part 149. I'm expecting the big ones to transition. Um, I'm not necessarily expecting all of them to transition. Okay. So with RAOs specifically, they're in the process of transitioning. Yes, they have applied. And um, just to Senator Patrick's point about the accident reports, so at the moment manufacturers can't access the accident reports. Will, section, will part 149 resolve that? Uh, Senator, I've, I'll have to take that on, yeah. as Dr. unless Dr. Ellicott has the answer. Currently, a manufacturer would have no greater access to RAO's documents than they would to any other company's documents. Um, under 149, as I said, I, I do not believe there is any provision, I'm sure there is no provision that expressly says accident reports, and RAOs does conduct accident investigations, um, are to be published. But CASA does have the authority under 149 to make directions, directions. and as such a direction could be made if as a matter of policy that decision were taken. Because you would release those mm. reports um, as a matter of course mm. under aircraft that are licensed or regulated under CASA regulations? Well, it, it, for conventional aircraft, accident investigations are conducted by the, the ATSB, ATSB yeah. and so the they, ATSB publishes okay. their reports. So that's a, that's a, a model that's there. Um, All right. So RAOS is a, is a private organisation? It is. That's correct. And it's, it's owned by the members? I'm not sure of the nature of their structure, but mm. it's, a co it's a corporate entity. It's a corporate entity. So we gave the regulation of recreational aircraft to a private entity of some description. Mm. We removed the regulatory mm. framework from those and gave it to a private entity, uh, which uh, now makes money out of it. Senator, in what happened was, up until 149, mm. um, RAOs administered their own affairs, managed their own pilot licensing schemes, and oversaw the maintenance of their own aircraft subject to the approval of their manuals by CASA, which was a condition on an exemption, an exemption which exists today. Effectively, all the sport aviation bodies were exempted from complying with 
virtually all of the civil aviation regulations, subject to the condition that they develop manuals and procedures that CASA would then approve. But if RAOs is not always, it's not always existed. It was it a was new preceded by the um, Australian Ultralight Federation was their predecessor organisation. Yeah, and that was okay. Right. Same arrangement for them. So that's something we're working towards then is the transition to Part 149 so that ATSB can investigate accidents and the reports can be made available to manufacturers in particular. Well, the, the, the ATSB can investigate them now if they chose. If they had the resources. Um, and yeah. what we're saying is that CASA doesn't have an accident investigation remit, but the safety management system arrangements that we envisage for 149 organisations would almost certainly include an assessment of accidents, and we would, as I said, this is a matter of policy, that's not my decision to make, but it certainly would be considered that the outcome of those investigations should be made available to the people who would benefit from them. Yeah. I, I think agree. that's a logic that's inescapable. Because at the moment, that is a, a black box. <clears throat> it, it is, but if it is, it has been for over 50 years, and hopefully it will be less of one now. Under there just weren't many pilots in it now. There's 10,000 pilots. 10, pilots and 3, aircraft. No. We do track the accident statistics yeah. of RAOs, but they're reported to us, but I was not aware of the um, the point that Senator Patrick was raising today about uh, not publishing reports. Yeah, they have shared their reports with us as in previously reason. on previous occasions. So. Senator Stirl is waiting yeah. very patiently. It's nine o'clock this morning. No, good Thank idea. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Carmody, you lucky so and so. So let's do a deal. Let's make your last one as president as possible, and let's make your last one as president as possible for me. Can we do that? Because what so I just want how, can to, I, how can I help? I just want some quick, short, direct answers, please. So that means, Dr. Alec, I'm not even going to ask you because you go on for hours. But anyway, <laughs> so Mr. Carmody, um, how's the troll of the... in the nicest possible way? Didn't Absolutely, you? Mr. Dr. Alec knows me, Crikey. So I want to ask a question around the Brisbane Fire yeah. Control yeah. Centre because we did visit up there and have a hearing up there. So how's the troll of the FCC cameras at Brisbane going? Senator, I didn't bring any airspace people with me, so I no, understand right. everything right. is I understand everything is going fine, but I can take it on notice and give you an answer. Okay, let's do this. Yeah. If you haven't got the people, because I haven't you. got any airspace people, all of the airspace team with me because of the limitations we have. All right, because I'm going to put them all on notice. Okay, then, because they'll only waste your time and mine. That'll be fine, Senator. Um, so because they're all around the fire response times, you yeah. know how topical that was. Yes, I do. Around the time of the inquiry, I'm also going to go to uh, questions around. Um, the four minutes, uh, what was it? Four minutes standard. There was trials, vehicles were a bit slow, they weren't getting the there. The response times and response those times. sort of matters, Senator. I'm, very, so, I'm broadly familiar with them, but not with yeah. where we're up to, but happy to take them on notice and answer them for well, you. Well, let's, let's put them on notice because they're, they're too important yep. not, to, to, not to do that. Um, we, when did we, can, are you able to come back, because you're leaving, are you able to come back to us with the uh, questions or do you have to go through the Minister's office? We normally, um, I'm not leaving until December, Senator, we normally um, uh, develop our responses to questions on notice and, go, and provide them through the department in the normal way. I think, oh. we've got to, I think we've got a couple of weeks to provide them. I think yeah, have, but normally they get caught up in the Minister's office. So I'm just saying, can we circumvent that because it's safety? I'll be as quick as we can, Senator. Okay, fantastic. Well, let's put them all on notice because it's, it is pretty important. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kelly. You see how I oh, operate? Oh, Senator Stirl, you are a, a, a shining example of efficiency. If everyone ran estimates the way I, I do, we would get so much done, you know well, that? I, <laughs> Thank you, Senator Stirl. That's great hmm. advice. Um, I think that's no, it for CASA. All of us. All of us, indeed. Senator, that's it for CASA. Senator, can I make a, a brief remark before I finish? Um, if I, with your indulgence, I've been appearing before Senate committees since the mid-1990s. Uh, it's mm. occasionally been challenging, uh, but there have been some high points and some low points. I just wanted to thank the committee for your consideration and state for the record that uh, it's been a privilege to be centrally engaged in this important democratic process, and thank you. We wish you all the very best in your Chair. future. Thank Chair. you very much. On behalf of the government, could yeah. I thank Mr Carmody for his great service to aviation um, over the time he's been at CASA and wish him all the best in whatever he might be doing next. Thank you very much. Here, here. Are Thank you, you Minister. Thank you. I am retiring, Senator. You lucky devil.
Well, so were you, aren't you, Senator Still? I retired 15 years ago. Yeah, well, we didn't have to say. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Thank terrific. You, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.